Welcome everybody to, this is our, what, um, seventh uh, webinar of this biological webinar series. Um, today, we're going to have a, a host of panelists kind of having a, a discussion format. So everybody is muted um, and your video is, is not on, but you can type questions into either the webinar chat or the Q&A, and we will try to answer those as we go along and, and answer any at, at the end of the discussion. So with that, Keith, would you like to go ahead and introduce our guests? Yep, sure would. Thanks, Dylan. Appreciate that. And yeah, I'm excited uh, for our discussion today. Uh, we have uh, Armin Miller with uh, Elevate Ag and then uh, Najia LaFontaine, uh, who we'll introduce here in just a moment, but uh, she brings a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, to the discussion as well. So just want to kind of real quickly give a, a brief overview of the first seven that we've done, or the first six, I guess. Uh, if you haven't seen them, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch them all. But we started out with Doug Kramer talking about the liquid rhizofixer, but specifically talking about microbes and the, the role that the rhizobia uh, play in, in fixing uh, atmospheric nitrogen for the legume plants as they associate with. We followed that with Jay Young uh, talking about the Johnson Sioux bioreactor, and he showed some examples of what he has done to both make the Johnson Sioux product as well as use it in his fields. Uh, the third week was Jim Ristow from South Dakota, and Jim uh, again talked about a, a little bit different type of composting method, uh, the spice method that he learned uh, here in good old Bladen, Nebraska, when he came down a few years ago for the workshop that we have with Jerry Gillespie and uh, Dr. Christine Jones. Uh, David Olson joined us from California and uh, talked uh, a lot about how important seed microbes are, the microbes that are on the seed, whether they get there from the natural occurrence of how that seed is grown and the environment of, about which it was grown, or if it is uh, some added biology about how important that was. And then two weeks ago, Scott Scheimer uh, and uh, Austin with uh, Elevate Ag uh, we're on and talked about uh, the Hypergrow product and how Scott's been using that out in Western Kansas. Uh, we're actually Eastern Colorado, probably both, and the success that he's been having with that product. And we're going to kind of follow up on some of that discussion here today. And then, of course, if you joined us last week, a really interesting conversation with Laura Decker. Uh, Laura is the president of Microbiometer, and uh, they make a uh, a, a really unique device for measuring and uh, looking at the fungal to bi bacterial uh, micro, uh, microbiomass, and it's a kind of a unique test that they can use without needing a lab. Uh, it just gives uh, people a way to assess how healthy their soil is and if they're going in the right direction. So all that's kind of led up to this. Uh, you know, we've got a big background in microbes and composting and how all those things are working. And we want to kind of build on what we've done the first six weeks and, and just kind of have a conversation around uh, the microbes and, and specifically on what do we do with the microbes once we get them, once we start creating the environment where we know we're having better microbial life in our soil. How do we take care of them? How do we manage them? How do we get the most out of them? And so to do that, uh, again, uh, I invited Armin Miller. Armin uh, is uh, with Elevate Ag, as I think most of you probably know. Green Cover is one of the owner partners of Elevate Ag. Elevate Ag is a Kansas-based company. We own a portion of it. Armin has some ownership, and then there's uh, other farmers within Kansas that have ownership as well. And it's a company that uh, it makes and distributes biological products. And so we wanted Armin to be on this call because uh, he has uh, been working with Nausea for a number of years now, uh, and uh, like I said, she is just a, a, a great source, a great wealth of knowledge and information. So Armin, I'm going to let you go ahead and do the introduction for Nausea, uh, since you have more uh, experience in working with her and some of the, the products and the processes that she's doing. So go ahead and, and do that introduction, and then we'll jump into a conversation. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, yes, it's a great pleasure of mine in order to introduce uh, Naja. Um, so where I started with Naja was, is I, I learned about her through a couple people. It was kind of simultaneously. And uh, it was kind of, I think, uh, somebody knocking on my door saying that I need to get to know this person. And the first time I listened to uh, Naja was a, a TNT talk. And it was basically a conversation 
about uh, producers talking about what they experienced with some of the uh, food products that, uh, and some of the other products that she put together. So Naja is a environmental engineer and a certified crop uh, consultant specializing in soil biology and rejuvenating the, our, our soil system, okay? So uh, Naja also designs a different soil rejuvenation products that uh, uh, are labeled underneath the TNT product line and uh, they help uh, with uh, soil management uh, system. She's also an educator and an influencer. And uh, uh, one of the things that she says is that she uh, does a lot of observing and learning from God's creation. And uh, that's really what, we, what we're doing is, is uh, reestablishing that soil. Uh, and Naja has a real great understanding that uh, she can explain it in the terms that I can understand that aren't... Uh, uh, so scientific or chemical based on there. So uh, with that, Keith, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, great. Thank you. And 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 even though uh, our friend Naja comes from our neighbor to the north in Canada, she doesn't have a super strong Canadian accent. So very easy to understand. Also wanted to let you know, if you have a copy of our ninth edition of the Soil Resource Guide, uh, Naja was a contributing author for this one. She's got a nice a uh, really nice two-page article in here about photosynthesis, how that works, and why that's important. So uh, if you don't have one of those, let us know, and we can make sure we get one of those. But Naja, I want to I kind of kick off the conversation. You know, we've been doing a lot of talking about microbes the last six weeks, uh, in getting them into our soil from different ways and, you know, keeping them happy. But from your perspective, tell us why you believe these microbes are so important to a healthy functioning soil system, and even more importantly, to an ag production system? Well, we have our digestive systems inside of our intestines, right? Without our digestive systems and the proper, and we know what can happen when the microbes in our gut get upset and, and you know, we run into problems, um, all sorts of trouble. Uh, a plant has its digestive system on the outside of its roots. And believe it or not, a lot of the organisms that help to digest food for plants, you know, extracting minerals from the soil and whatnot, are actually the same organisms that digest food in our own guts. So we're not a whole lot different, plants and, and us. And the need for um, that, that relationship between the plant and the soil microbes um is i mean it's, it's just built into the you know how everything was created where they you know you, you want to talk about you know creation science or and uh evolution whatever it, it's that's how it it's supposed to be and when we start to take parts of it out whether deliberately or accidentally um then things start to get out of balance and when they start to get out of balance, a lot of times they get even more out of balance, um, especially when we're, we try to go into rescue with um, things that are, again, contrary to how things work, then it throws it even more out of whack. And, and I find that we're, we're in a situation um, globally where we have for decades now, abuse the soil and not paid proper attention to that um, micro plant relationship. And it wants to work, it wants to thrive. Um, and so a lot of times all we have to do is get out of its way, um, but we can accelerate it and we can amplify it and we can uh, augment it by having a little bit better understanding of it and giving it a little bit of a helping hand and kind of coaxing it along. And so that's, that's kind of what I do with my work with my clients or in things like this, like this uh, podcast to discuss that relationship and the importance of it. Yeah, I, I love that analogy of, you know, that digestive system. And, and I heard a speaker once, I don't remember who it was, but they said everything has to go through a gut, you know, so everything that gets into that plant has to go through a gut of some kind. 
or at least in the natural system. And, you know, a lot of it's going through microbes, but some of it's going through earthworms and, you know, other larger soil biological organisms. And yeah, it's just so important for making those nutrients available. And when we don't have that, you know, our crops suffer and then we have to step in with what I call agricultural welfare and give the handouts, you know, out of the jug or out of the bottle uh, because the natural system isn't working the way that it's supposed to. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we talk extensively about how important diversity is. We, you know, diversity is one of the key tenets of soil health. And, and that applies not only to having plant diversity on our soil, but, but especially for the biological diversity. So how do we get biological diversity in our soils when we don't have great cash crop diversity? You know, we're maybe only growing corn and soybeans or you know, uh, out in the West, you know, they're, they're growing just, you know, wheat every year. How, how do we, what are some practical ways that farmers can really help capture biological diversity when we don't have a lot of cash crop diversity? Um, well, one of the ways you, you can, um, you can do that is again, look in, look at nature. And when nature is growing things, you don't see monoculture okay so when we grow things in monoculture we're actually doing things in opposition to nature and so if if while we're not going to uh you know mimic you know 140 different species of, of plants in our fields that's just not practical um that would be called weeds or weeds in the field <laughs> but uh you know, if you're growing uh, wheat, is it feasible to, you know, do a wheat and pea blend? Those are two crops that are very easy. If you have even basic screening equipment, you can screen and separate wheat wheat from peas. Or maybe you're, whoever you're selling it to, they're happy to have the, the peas in mm -hmm. with the wheat because they're going to use it for feed or something like that. So uh, looking at, you know, potential intercropping. Um but also the, the, the potential for, uh, I mean, we don't have to harvest every single seed that we plant. So depending on where you're growing, um, it may be feasible to underseed, again, I'm gonna use wheat as an example, but underseed that with some clover, right? So when you harvest, the, you know, if there's any clover that, that, that sap just goes through the combine back out on the field, but that you get that, you know, you're getting that extra diversity of that extra plant type in there you can do the same thing with with corn you can go in at you know knee high and and maybe do a under seeding of uh, annual ryegrass or some clovers or you know whatever works or you can uh, interseed when you're planting with some you know some peas that might grow for half the season then you know die out once the corn plants get tall enough and shade mm -hmm. them out but but you can get extra diversity in that way uh, another way to do it is cover crops and again, that, that theory that we don't have to harvest every seed that we plant, right? Um, the microbes are there in the soil. They're there all the time. And they're like a teenage boy. They want to eat all the time. They're, they're constantly eating. So if we don't have a living plant, fixing fresh carbon, which gets then converted to, we'll just call it sugars, but exudates, which can be all kinds of different things, and pumping that into the soil to continue to feed those soil organisms, they're gonna eat what's already sitting there. And one of the very first things that they will eat is uh, the glomalin, which is the substance that holds the, that beautiful crumb structure in the soil. It's one of the easiest things for them to get at and eat. So the very first thing that your soil microbes are gonna do in the absence of a living plant to continue to feed them is to start to tear down the house that they spent all season building. And it's gonna de degrade your soil structure. So if, however you can manage to get and have living plants on your field, whether you can get a cover crop in after your main crop, or maybe if you can get something in like oats and peas or something like that first thing in the spring, um, even one inch of growth is better than, I mean, you'd think that there's not a lot there, but though that one inch of, of oats is actually doing a, a lot of work already, um, you know, prior to your main crop um, or even, you know, weeds, weeds. I mean, it's, it's green. It's 
uh, what I tell my clients is if, if you don't pick the weeds, Mother Nature is going to pick the weeds and you might not like the ones that she picks. So <laughs> yeah. pick ones that have a specific purpose or, or uh, whether you for a function for nitrogen fixing or soil, uh, you know, structure or whatever, or maybe just because it's easy to terminate or it winter kills or whatever, whatever suits your needs, then you choose that weed and grow that weed. And then you at least you've got something good to grow and it's it's another different plant right if i if for, as far as the diversity of, of microbes go um, if you wanted to go someplace and have a diversity of foods right you would make sure you would invite people from england and people from china and people from the middle east and people from france and people from you know south america and people from mexico because then you're going to get all the different kinds of food that all those people are going to bring to that potluck dinner and so the same thing is applicable to the soil microbes, right? And and the plants. Each plant provides a different suite of exudates and compounds and the different uh, types of microorganisms that prefer this, that, or the other thing then also uh, are able to flourish in the soil. So the more diversity you can get in, the more biological diversity you can stimulate and the more quickly you can, um, you know, spur that, that soil regeneration and, and that uh, increased fertility. Yeah, that's great. That was point. the short, that was the short answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and thanks a lot. Now you've made me hungry talking about food from all these <laughs> wonderful places. But uh, uh, by the way, folks, uh, since this is kind of a conversation, we want to invite everybody into the conversation. So if you have a question about something that you hear us say, go ahead and and uh, put it in the Q&A box, or you can put it out on the chat for the panelists. And, and we'll try to work that question into uh, the conversation that we're doing. You can also ask questions that we'll answer at the end as well. But Armin, I'm gonna come to you with this, this kind of the same question. You are on the road a lot. You're out visiting lots of farmers. You see uh, lots of different operations and lots of different environments. What are some of the ways that you've seen uh, really innovative farmers working to get that microbial diversity into their soil. Well, Keith, one, one of the ways, and you know, we, we Jim Ristow kind of hit on it uh, earlier in one of the conferences is, is a compost. And it just yesterday, I had a gentleman call me from Seneca. And about four years ago, he uh, bought a product from me that uh, we made prior to Elevate Egg. It was a compost blend with a calcium base to it. And uh, he called and he said, and I'd, I had not heard from him for four years. And he called and he says, you know, we take on new uh, ground, rent new ground. And he said, uh, that set of fields that I took that product to survived and have outperformed even in droughts over the last. And the bottom line was, is that it, it's like Naja said, it had a, had a compost base to it. So it had a food source that kept those microbes alive and kept them cycling the nutrients. And it created diversity over time because it wasn't something that the plants gave that diversity of microbes. And this is one of the questions that I have for nausea. You know, if you don't have the proper microbes out there, how do you change it if you don't bring some diversity of microbes to the party at the beginning of the year? or you don't bring that diversity of cover crops, how do you change the diversity of your microbes to have the right microbes? Or how long does it take in order to build those microbes up in order to get the right diversity for that crop that, that will now cycle those nutrients on there, nausea? Yeah, so um, if you just want things to just kind of, you know, proceed on their own, um, Without the diversity of, of plants and the cropping system, it's not going to happen. Um, the old adage, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is very much applicable to this type of situation as well. Uh, that's something I would definitely encourage um, anybody who's growing anything to really try to consider how to, to do that. But in the interim, um, if you don't have that or you're, you're working, you know, the boss doesn't want to doesn't want to do it um, or um, you want to speed things up, then absolutely, um, wherever you can get your hands on any kind of organic matter, whether it's compost, compost teas, 
um, even you know various different microbial inoculants, jug jug and or bug in a jug things or whatever. Those are helpful. Um, there's lots of stuff that blows around on the wind that we can't even we we, we don't see. Lots of stuff. Um, and as the soil improves, you know those things will will also flourish. But they they will likely need a, a you know diversity of uh, plant population in order to self sustain. Um, but yeah, compost teas are great. Um, animal uh, having animals on on if you you can incorporate rotational grazing. Um, if you don't have that, then even just animal manures um, can be helpful. Um, I was, I was talking uh, last week or the week before about um, looking at fresh, fresh steam and cow manure under the microscope and having to look to see what that looks like under the microscope. And I can tell you that I've never seen anything so lively and full of diversity as fresh, fresh right off the, the assembly line cow manure. So, uh, well, well, you know, aged manure or manure from manure pile spread on a field is is great. There, there is no substitute for that fresh deposition from an animal and this, you know, the saliva and the action of the hoofs and the pulling on the teeth of the teeth or whatever. I mean, that's how it was. That's what the plants are expecting. That's what they, they, you know, will will say evolved with or you know how they're designed to to work. So that's the you know cat's meow ideal, but if if you don't have that then absolutely you know compost teas and and whatnot and knowing to understanding you were talking about earlier um food uh, fungal to bacterial ratios and understanding uh you're getting a little bit of an assay on the soil to understand what uh, organisms are there and which ones are lacking or in imbalanced and and then looking for sources to uh supplement and repopulate those those um, things that I mean, there's a lot of talk about, you know, Johnson Sioux reactors and fungal populations, and and I mean, wherever you or you can, you can get uh, effective microbes where you can kind of harvest them yourself and grow them in in the soil, if you're so inclined to to do that, you know, to try to increase your uh, fungal populations in the soil, um, you know, various diff different ways of doing that. And then once you've got your organisms, then uh, just like you wouldn't take, you know. 100 head of cattle and put them in a barn and close the door and say, okay, well, I'll come back in a month. You want to make sure that you <laughs> don't think you'd have too many cows left. Well, the same thing when you use these inoculants and throw them out in the soil. If they don't have anything to eat, whether it's a live living plant um, or you know, sufficient organic matter for them to scavenge, which is not the greatest, um, or something that you put down, you know, the, I, I like anytime I put more microorganisms down, whether it's a compost tea or a, a bug in a jug or whatever. Uh, I mean, manures come with their automatic um, food source for the microbes because they're still not not done with it. But but any any of those other ones, uh, compost teas, uh, extracts, um, bug in a jug things, I like putting down a food source. And there's a whole list of different things that you can use for food sources for different organisms yeah and, and we're i think we'll uh we'll, we'll get on that topic here in a little bit on the food sources and stuff but i, I really mm -hmm. like your your point there of you know if you're putting these things out there whether it be an extract or you know a commercial bug in a jug type product and you're not changing the rest of your system to support that it's it's not likely going to work very well and so i think that's why you know a lot of times i, I tell people all the time that i don't think you know, biology can be very effective, but it's not always as consistent as chemistry because no, it, because it's living. Yeah, right? it's living. And it's it, alive and it can die. factors. <laughs> and then it's so dependent upon the system that you have built around it as well. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that I, I want to, uh, from the audience that I'll throw out to you. But before I get to those is, you know, the I, I love what you said in Armin too about you know the the importance of having those diverse plants there to support that diverse biology and 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 I know that we've talked to our client base and our customers about this particular topic before, but I was just working with a, a customer from Illinois this morning. He's growing, so he's a corn soybean guy. He's committed to this regenerative path, so he's starting to get wheat into his rotation. 
uh, which, you know, in Illinois is, is not the common thing. And then he's going to follow up that wheat. So he's got wheat in the ground, he'll harvest that in July, and then he's going to plant sunflowers, double crop sunflowers, to try to harvest as a second cash crop. But then underneath those, you, you know, I'm designing a mix for him right now that, you know, has mung beans and cow peas and spring peas and clover and flax and buckwheat and mustard, you know, so he'll, he'll have like 12 things out there growing and he'll harvest one of them and the rest of it is all completely going to be for the soil. And, and so those are the types of innovative producers we love working with because they're, they're really thinking through ways that they can not only harvest a cash crop, but also have all this diversity. The same concept of, you know, interceding uh, with your corn, you know, interceding at V3 or V4 to just get some other things out there so it's not uh, not quite as, you know, much of a monoculture. And so on that topic, Kevin, uh, Kevin is asking, he says, I've heard that there can be significant differences in biology, even among different varieties of the same plant species, uh, like as much as up to 10% difference. Uh, and I think he's talking about, you know, the ability of different, uh, so if it's seed corn, different varieties of corn to host different biological populations. So his question is, is there significant value to blend multiple varieties of the same plant species to increase microbial diversity? So does it make sense to plant three or four different types of corn together or in a cover crop, maybe three or four different varieties of sorghum uh, to, to try to capture that diversity? Um, I think it's more important to um, plant different plant families together and try and, and cover the different plant families because while there is diversity within uh, just, just like people you know ethnicity of, of uh, people you have diversity within the ethnicities but there's you know there's there's differences and so the same thing with with plants you want to make sure that that uh, you know if you're going to be growing stuff all year that you've got you know some cool season grasses, some warm season grasses. Yes, they're all grasses, but there's an example of where the diversity uh, can make a difference. You want to make sure you got legume represented. You want to make sure you've got, um, you know, something in in the uh, brassica family, and then also something in the you know chenopod family is also bumps things up mm -hmm. up a notch. So uh, I think having uh, representation of the different families is more more critical i mean corn is one of those those things that you can have a huge difference in varieties i mean there's there's corn varieties now that are being developed uh, if you can believe it to to withstand drought that by the very nature of that that breeding tends to select for corn varieties that refuse a mycorrhizal relationship <laughs> so you know oh yeah wow. great the but you know the plant is more resistant to drought but it refuses a mycorrhizal relationship so you're refusing the relationship that by its very nature would make the plant more drought resistant all yeah. on its own yeah right without so, the monkey and with genetics and yeah. the mycorrhiza also frees up all kinds of nutrients especially phosphorus and calcium mm -hmm. which are two things that are very very important right yeah. so are we so, are we doing a good thing by doing that or sh you know so that's that's right. another another question but yeah, so, so I, think, I think in looking at, at kevin's question again he, he might be asking more so about so let's take wheat for an example if he's planting wheat as a cash crop do you think it would be beneficial if he had three or four varieties of wheat all mixed together and planted out there still a monoculture because it's still wheat but you know he may have three or four different varieties he can still harvest it all haul it to the co-op so in that in instance you know there's no penalty from a harvesting standpoint but do you see any benefits from a biological standpoint doing that versus just a single variety yeah not not overly um i mean if you're going to do that you got to watch to make sure that that you know, the, the wheat's going to mature at the same time and it's going to have the, I mean, you don't want to plant like a hard wheat and a soft wheat together, you know, 
because mm -hmm. you want to make sure you have a consistent quality in your end product. So it kind of sort of limits what you can do um, that way. But I, I don't think that you're going to have a huge uh, difference in what those plants are going to do from an exudate perspective, either from the roots or the leaves um, with regard to the soil. I don't think it's going to be that big of a difference. Um, I know, I know that along that topic, you know, one of the things that I know Rick Clark was talking about doing this is, is he's going to plant multiple varieties of wheat together and, and he's, he's doing all old varieties. So there's no protection. There's no licensing issues, but he's going to then just keep replanting what he harvests. So he's going to epigenetically make that fit his specific environment, both the biological environment, as well as the climate environment. Yep. And so essentially, you know, after a few generations, he'll have something that's completely different than anything on the market, simply Absolutely. because he's made it adapt to what he's got going. Exactly. And there, that's where there's a, a benefit. If he's going to be keeping his own seed, yes. then, then yes, you're going to have, you know, this variety might be resistant to this disease and this one might be more drought resistant and this one might be you know, more frost tolerant or whatever. And through the successive generations, if you are keeping your own seed and it's not important for the, who are you selling it to, to have that specific variety and the traits that are associated with that specific variety, then uh, by all means. And, and I think that's one thing that we've kind of gotten away from and that we've lost in our modern agriculture is, you know, somebody from Dakota is gonna buy wheat that was bred and developed in, in Michigan and the, the conditions aren't the same. And while it grows great in Michigan, you plant it in North Dakota and hey, that's not what it says on the <laughs> on the label for what I'm supposed to get, right? But we've gotten away from the old way of doing things where where the the local strains were very well adapted to the very local conditions, right? And even, you know, what you would grow on your farm is going to be different from what your neighbor five miles down the road is going to grow right because you might have slightly different soil or depending on like where i'm situated it's bizarre but there's about a 10 mile square square mile area and the, the crop insurance guys know about it because they come out and they're like oh you're from that area because it tends to be more drought prone than the surrounding areas for whatever reason i say moses dropped his staff out in the field there way back when that's <laughs> <laughs> so I, I tell people, but I mean, you can see the storms come and they either shoot off to the north or they shoot off to the to the south, right? And like, where'd the rain go? Um, but so you know, somebody who was growing their own varieties and keeping their own seed in that area would have would buy their it, own. It would just nature. adapt, sure. But yeah, they would yeah. automatically select for ones that would do better in those conditions. So in in uh, for that, I would say, yeah. I, I wish more farmers would would yeah. do that. We, and, we, and the genetic diversity the... also, lack of genetic diversity also opens up um, our our food supply to the potential for for mass devastation. Right? Mm -hmm. If we have all the same genetics all over the place, you know, more or less, then you don't have that natural genetic diversity. So if a disease comes through, or or you know, poor conditions, or insects, or whatever then you have that monoculture that you end up with larger systemic failures, right? Yeah. So it's a very exposed position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just, just to kind of maybe close this topic out before we move on to uh, the next topic, Marlon uh, from Idaho is saying that there in Idaho, there's some innovative farmers who have created a new crop. They're doing things together uh, called Parley, P-A-R-L-E-Y. They're growing peas and barley together harvesting it like you suggested. Sometimes they're separating it, sometimes they're not. If it's going to the feed market, why, why separate it? it? It's a pretty pretty complete ration or it can go back to the cover crop market. Said another new crop is uh, Pimalina, uh, peas and Camelina. I, I think those guys in Idaho don't have anything better to do, so they just <laughs> sit around making up <laughs> new novel days, maybe. But but I know I, that- I, I would be careful if Mo and Ron were getting together to come put something together <laughs> but otherwise i'm all for it <laughs> well there's there might be a lot of people that would buy the moron mix but <laughs> that's a pretty big customer segment but not not our customers right 
but but I know I know for a fact that that in the past we have bought a lot of the flax that we use as cover crops, some of the chickpeas, you know, flax and chickpeas are another example of two things that grow very well together. Yeah, they uh, hairy vetch and rye. We're we're by we're getting some hairy vetch coming in out of Canada right now that they're separating out of the rye that they grew. And so there's there's a lot of very successful polycropping type systems out there. It's not for the faint of heart, and it's not for the guy that's not willing to work, but for those that are, you can definitely add value to both of those crops. Absolutely. And if you're growing the two crops together, right, and let's say you get, you know, 80% of your rye crop, which you would normally get, and you get 80% of your pea crop or veg crop. Well, yeah, if you look at them each individually, you've got a reduced yield. But together, you've got way more productivity mm -hmm. on that soil because they help each other out, both structurally, so they support each other, each other structurally, uh, but also nutritionally, right? I, I love growing a grass, whether it's wheat, rye, oats, barley, or whatever, with a legume, like a pea or a vetch, or that, that can get a little bit out of hand. Rye is a good choice, <laughs> but the shorter stuff, not so much. But, but having, because the, when you have that mycorrhizal relationship in the soil, both of those plants are mycorrhizal. And what happens is the mycorrhiza interconnects your legume with your grass and starts to exchange sugars between the, the grasses and the legumes and also exchange nitrogen from the legumes to the grasses. So your grasses grow better, they produce more sugar, and then which then allows the legume to produce more uh, nitrogen. So there's there's that again there's that natural connection that natural interrelationship between the microbes that connects the plants together and, and you get a synergistic uh, effect. Yeah, it's it's emulating the way God created plants to grow together in diverse cultures and not in monoculture. So absolutely, I I do want to move on to kind of the next topic here. You know, once we have all these microbes and and Naja, you mentioned it earlier, we, we have to feed them. You know, you can't lock your cows in the barn for a month and then not come back. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the food sources and and specifically some of the things that Armin is in the hypergrow product. You know, last week, uh, Austin and, and Scott talked about this quite a bit. But, you know, hypergrow is it's a compost extract, which has been talked about a lot. But then we're adding other things into it. And some of them uh, are, can be food sources, and some of them are more of the stimulant package. So, Ar Armin, I want you to kind of do a little bit of a discussion here, talking about the different ingredients that are in that product, and then let's have Naja comment on what the purpose of those things are. Yeah, Keith, um, you know, one of the things that we realized is if we can start them out in the soil at uh, as early as possible, um, these microbes, uh, so in like hypergrow, there's a, a large set of diverse microbes that are in there. And so there's some food sources that are also in there. These microbes are more in a stasis um, a situation, so they can withstand a little bit of a battle, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that they could be put in with uh, some of your, uh, um, your chemicals, which would be like your 32s, your 28s, your liquid fertilizers, those kind of things, and, and still withstand that salt in there. Um, but what also that's added to those is a is a, a, a humic and a fulvic acid, a kelp that's in there, and um, a chitosan that's in there. Um, and they all serve a different purpose in, in these situations in order to help get that those microbes started. The other things that we like to put, which is a really high food source, so you, you got to keep those microbes in stasis, if you give them too much food, meaning like a hydrolysate or a fermented fish or some kind of a, a carbon base uh, like molasses and that kind of stuff, they want to go to eat and then go to work and, and they'll do that in your tank. So we try to keep that away from there and add it just when they're ready to go into the soil. So there's a lot of different um, things that are going on. We also put in, in the hypergrow a mineral base and, a, and also a uh, chelated minerals in there. So these, you got to think that uh, we eat a diversity. We don't need as much of the multivitamin. 
But if we don't eat that, uh, that, that diversity, we need that multivitamin. And that's where we come in with like sea crop, something, all these minerals that come from the ocean and that can supply some of that. So those are the things that we put in to hypergrow in order to get it started. Then there's the large food sources after we start that we like to inject in the row to help populate. And like Christine Jones says, let's get started with a little bit of quorum sensing, meaning that, you know, it's, I may be okay with a hammer, but I'm not very good as a plumber, you know, and if I could hire this group that could build this house that we're building in the soil, that there's, everybody has a purpose in a, in a job, that's uh, uh, going to go a lot quicker. So that's part of the concept of putting these together on there. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear Naja's comments and that kind of stuff on, on some of those products out there. Yeah, so I kind of just scratched down some some notes here. So um, the the sea crop that you're mentioning, mentioning the the sea minerals, um, those are very handy because I mean, what are the sea minerals except for the minerals that have leached out of the land, gone into the rivers, and whatnot, and gone out into the sea, right? And then water evaporates, and they just sit there in the sea. They just continue to accumulate in the sea. Um, yeah, there's on you know deep hydrothermal vents and and whatnot and underground volcanoes but the vast majority of the sea minerals come from leaching from the land so um, we take those sea minerals and we put them back on the land because they tend to be slightly deficient because they've leached out and they tend to to leach and, and go away so there is benefit to using those uh, sea minerals to uh, get them uh, those minerals back back onto the land and i mean there's like all kinds of weird bizarre minerals that nobody's ever heard of uh, but we don't need to know what they specifically do because the microbes know what to do with them and the plants know what to do with them and each enzyme and vitamin and and uh, uh, compound that our bodies use that plants produce uh, they'll have usually have a, a key mineral in them um, and uh one example of that is vitamin B12, cobalamin. Um, and as the name implies, the center mineral in that is cobalt. And so if the microbes have insufficient cobalt, the plants have insufficient cobalt, then we can't have cobalamin or vitamin B12. And what's the prevalent nutrient deficiency in society nowadays? Oh, B12 deficiency. <laughs> so hmm. the question, you know, are we, are we, um, you know, producing food that has the, the proper nutrient density in it. So sea minerals is, is one way to, you know, um, get some of those really super ultra trace minerals back onto the plants, back to the microbes, so they can make those compounds that they, they need to make that we need to for, for our health as well. Um, humic acid, the, the humic substances, um, those can be bacterial foods. They also tend to come with, um, within their, their chemical structure, if you could imagine like a great big huge fishing net is what they would look like. Um, and it's just loaded with not only carbon, but also oxygen. So it's a chemically bound oxygen source for microbes, which is fantastic if you have, you know, somewhat anaerobic conditions, you, that way you can ensure that you still have oxygen available to your microbes. But the humic acids are also, um, it's like, trying to eat a chuck roast. It's a little chewy for the for the bacteria, um, but the fungi love it. So the humic acids tend to be, uh, while they'll stimulate the, the bacteria, they also will stimulate the, the soil fungi. So that's good because soil fungi are typically sorely lacking. And so whatever we can do to stimulate that, um, part of the, the soil microbiome is, is critical. Um, they're also pretty stable because of that. And they also will latch onto all kinds of, of uh, uh, minerals, nutrients to stop them from leaching. So they, they uh, especially now nowadays with soils degraded as they were, I know in the Great Lakes uh, region, soils used to be upwards of 20, 30% organic matter. And now we're looking at soils that are typically under three or four percent. That's that's where we're at. So these these humic substances can help 
retain nutrients while we work on um, restoring the soil organic matter level. Uh, fulvic acid is, uh, um, that does a lot of interest. Well, another thing that humic, humic acids do is, is for root growth stimulant. So that helps when you get that little seed sprouts, those humic acids can really spur that, that root growth, which is good for all kinds of reasons. Um, fulvic acids are good for stimulating the plant's immune system. They're also a highly bacterial food, uh, but they're also about three or four times more potent as a, as a nutrient chelator than the humic acids. So uh, very useful for um, carrying nutrients either right into the plants or uh, making nutrients available uh, to, to microbes or holding on to nutrients for as long as that fulvic acid is going to be there till the bacteria get at them. Uh, fungi will also get at the fulvic acid, but it's more of a, uh, the, the bacteria have more of an affinity to that than, than what the fungi do. Uh, your chitosan is going to do a couple of things. Um, that's going to stimulate your plant's immune system. Uh, it's also going to um, provide a certain amount of calcium to your plants. Um, and, and make for really strong cell walls, which can help with um, making it more difficult for pathogenic fungi to penetrate cells of the plant. So it, it helps to um, kind, of, kind of stave off uh, fungal uh, infection, uh, but it also um, stimulates the soil microorganisms that really have a taste for, for that family of compounds. And one of the other compounds that they like to get a hold of once they turned on to this chitosan is chitin in the soil. And chitin is from you know insect shells. And there's usually that all over the place. But one of the other things that's also critical is pathogenic fungi, the spores of those in the soil are usually made out of chitin. So if you can turn on the soil microbes that want to eat chitin, you can also turn on the soil microbes that are going to tear apart that protective coating on that fungal pathogenic fungal spore, which then opens that fungal spore to other things to go in and destroy it. Fusarium is a perfect example of that. So if you can stimulate that, that uh, chitin digestion uh, cycle in the soil, you can uh, decrease your uh, fusarium load in your soil and the potential for that. Uh, kelp is another one that is uh, uh, highly uh, fungal food. Um, fungi really like it. It also has um, plant growth regulators, whether it be for root growth or uh, vegetative growth. Um, and it's, a, it's almost like a, a chill pill for your plants. Uh, for example, if you know, if you look at the weather forecast and go, okay, the plants aren't looking too, too bad, but it looks like I got like a week or two weeks of hot, sunny weather coming up. You get out there with, say, a foliar spray of kelp. Um, it's, it's like a stress reliever for the plant. So you can help that plant get through that stressful time. Uh, including that in with your soil uh, microbes helps stimulate the fungal portion of the soil, uh, helps stimulate germination. It's a natural uh, germination stimulant. Uh, and helps get those roots growing initially. So there's, there's a lot of benefits to all of those things. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Armin, or? Yeah, talk a little bit about the, like the hydrolysates, uh, those kind of things as a food system for these microbes and for the fungi and what kind of spurs them, you know, including uh, high energy fish, uh, those kind of things as we can add those throughout the season or to that cover crop in order to promote more one exudates, more growth, those kind of things on there. Talk, talk a little bit about how that works. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to um, protein digestate products, we'll just call it that because you can, you can make a hydrolysis out of any kind of meat really. Um, it doesn't have to be fish. Um, well, well, we'll just talk about fish today. So there's, there's three different products really that to, to discuss. You've got uh, a hydrolysate, which you, you mentioned, and that is basically, you know, whatever fish parts are being digested, which are just di digested enough to basically liquefy the fish so you can pour it. 
Uh, but it also includes all of the fats that are naturally there. They, the fats haven't been removed. Then you have an emulsion, which has been cooked in order to extract the fats out of the, so it's broken down, it's also liquidy, but the fats have been removed from it. So you lose the, well, it has value. There's, you know, nutrients in there. There's micronutrients, there's, you know, some nitrogen, there's proteins, amino acids and whatnot. By removing the fats, um, well, you're going to eliminate or avoid the, the gumming up of your, <laughs> your equipment with fish oils and stuff. Um, but those oils are not digestible by bacteria. They're only digestible by soil fungi. And so by going with an emulsion versus a, a hydrolysate, you lose a significant portion of that fungal stimulating um, proportion. So for in soil, I prefer uh, uh, a hydrolysate versus an emulsion. Um, and then you've got the fermented product. So the high energy fish is unique in the fermented fish category in that it is made with whole salmon. Um, so the salmon flesh has different properties from other fish, but because you're also doing it with a, a whole salmon, you're getting all of the meat and you're getting all of the skin, where some other products may be just with the carcasses because they've taken the fillets out. So they've taken the meat and whatever skin comes with that off. And then what's left, you get some skin off the backbone and, and you know, the fins and what's on the head and whatnot, that, that goes in. But you're, you're missing out on on that full uh, carcass. So the, the high energy fish is, is a little bit different in the hydrolysates in that way. But the other way that it's different is that where a, a hydrolysate or an emulsion is just broken down enough so that you can liquefy the fish and pour it and use it. The fermented fish is allowed to naturally ferment for 12 to 18 months. And so it's different in that where the, the more raw fish has complete proteins in there, still has some work to be done to break it down. Um, you get a little bit of an initial kick, but then the mic soil microbes have to work to release the rest of it and work on the rest of it. Whereas the, the high energy fish, it's, that's already been done. So 100% of that high energy fish is immediately available and very simple uh, compounds and immediately available to the, the soil microbes. And if you're adding that to a, a compost tea brew or something like that, you can see how fast stuff works to get that stuff going. Um, and it all also, um, because everything is, you know, the fats are, are chopped up, broken down and converted to water soluble compounds, you don't have, while you have the the building blocks of the oil there, because the oil has been broken down to its building blocks, you don't have the oil itself. So again, you don't have a problem with gumming up of your equipment. Um, but by using, you can use the, you either use that in trench. Uh, it's both a bacterial and a fungal stimulant. Everything just seems to go absolutely, you know, nuts on, on that stuff. Um, I think it's because it's so easily readily available. It's like giving a three-year-old a sucker right? Or, or a can of pop. <laughs> That's what you're doing to the soil microbes with the high energy fish. But it's, it's very useful as a foliar for that reason, because it, it's, that energy is all immediately available. And it provides the plant with various different building blocks to make proteins and uh, amino acids, proteins, and also fats. It can rebuild the fats from the fat building blocks. So the plant is short circuiting the building of all of those um, building blocks itself. And so it can very quickly uh, produce those fats. And you see that when you use it in a foliar spray, within a few days, you start to see that nice waxy sheen come on the, on the leaves and um, which you're not going to see that with, with a, a hydrolysate or, or, or an emulsion. That's one of the ways that the high energy fish is, is very different. And those fats that you're seeing on the, that the plant is exuding on the leaf surface, the plant is also exuding similar fats out through the root system. And again, because fats are digestible by fungi and not bacteria, the exuding of those um, lipids, those fats out through the root system 
um, it is a, a driving um, force for stimulating the soil fungi in that relationship. So did, did that kind of answer your question? Yeah, Naja, talk a little bit about how molasses or the sugar-based uh, uh, blackstrap, those kind of things work with in the same microbial fungal units like these other products. You hear a lot of people stimulating uh, their plants on a foliar basis or in the soil with those type of products out there. Yeah, so yeah, molasses or, or any other kinds of sugars as well. I, I prefer to use um, whole, I call them whole fertilizers, uh, like a molasses versus some people will just buy like cane sugar and just use cane sugar. Um, and while a, a raw cane sugar is going to come with some minerals, the molasses is basically all the minerals have been extracted from making white table sugar, which has nothing in it but sugar. And with a little bit of that white sugar left in it. So there's a lot of minerals left behind with, with molasses. So there's the benefit of that. You're getting like a, a micronutrient boost along with the, the molasses, especially um, iron. Um, that's, that's probably one of the, the nutrients that a lot of people don't think about uh, as far as um, providing that to the plants, especially in a, for, in a foliar capacity. Um, and uh, we talked about, or we talked about, we didn't talk about, I wrote in the, the article that um, Keith mentioned about photosynthesis, um, about chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is made out of uh, magnesium with four uh, nitrogen around it. And the plant puts that chlorophyll together and attaches that nitrogen to the magnesium. So there's two things that are needed for chlorophyll, which then makes sugars, which then can feed the soil microbes. But it uses iron to do that. And without sufficient iron, the plant assembly line for chlorophyll is slowed down. So that's one of the ways that, that molasses can, can help from a foliar perspective. Um, one of the other ways that it helps is um, a lot of times when I go in, and do uh, field testing and I measure the bricks or the sugar content of, of plants, they're almost always low. And when you have low bricks, um, that's an invitation for insects to, to go and munch on the plants. And so by using a sugar source or molasses in a foliar, you're immediately addressing the low sugar level in the plant by putting sugars in. But the form of sugar in molasses is also usually sucrose, which is two sugars put together, which a lot of insects have a hard time digesting. So by putting that kind of sugar into the plant, you make the plant undigestible to the insects and the insects go away. Aphids are a perfect example. You get rid of aphids, you use molasses and they'll be gone. Um, in the soil, putting that molasses in there is a good uh, sugar source to stimulate uh, bacteria. And while most soils are a more important microbial deficiency in soils is fungi, the bacteria are key for supporting the fungi because the bacteria are, are I don't know if they're more efficient, but they're going to free up nutrients a lot faster. They're going to work a lot faster to free up nutrients than what soil fungi do. And so um, you can help with the recovery of fungal populations by helping the recovery of the bacterial populations because the fungi will establish a relationship with the bacteria and they will help each other out. So if you can get the, the bacteria going, they'll help get the fungi going too. So sugar sources are, are helpful that way. But yes, I do like molasses. But if you're going to use molasses to address the, the low bricks content in plants, by all means, find out why the bricks is low in the first place and see if you can address that, right? Is there any other food sources out there for these microbials and fungi that we haven't covered that you, that you would recommend? Um, stuff that's, that's easy. Um, well, um, one, one thing is uh, residue, right? That's a microbial food source. Um, if you have a high carbon residue like straw or corn, 
uh, stubble or, you know, leaves or wood chips or whatever. Maybe you just took out a force of air and you shredded a bunch of stuff and there's wood chips all over the surface. Um, if you incorporate that high carbon material into the soil, bacteria reproduce very quickly and they feed themselves first. And they're going to look at all this carbon and, and go, wow, we need nitrogen to break this down. And, and so they're going to they're pull nitrogen out of the soil faster than your plants can. So you want to be careful with incorporating high carbon material into the soil, or at least how deep, what not keep it in the surface. Um, you leave it on the surface. And here's this is where, you know, one of the benefits of, of no-till. Um, the only place where the bacteria can really get at that material is right at where it's touching the soil, right at that soil residue interface, where it tends to be a little bit moister. Um, because bacteria need a lot higher moisture level than fungi do to operate. So the soil fungi will go through the soil and actually go up into that residue mat and break it down. And the bacteria will only be working at that interface level, right? So... Um, it's another reason why we don't want to do tillage because not only does it physically destroy it, but biologically it breaks it down too fast as well. Yeah, and and by by getting that residue and putting it underneath the soil, now you have you're making that residue really moist, which then makes it, you know, a, a good environment for bacteria, mm -hmm. and then then they're going to just strip nitrogen out of the soil to to get at that carbon source right and so now you're going to look at nitrogen deficiency problems and yeah. and um so yeah. there's this i mean as far as tillage goes if you want to incorporate it the shallower you can incorporate that the better so if you do want to you, you know kind of get it into the soil a little bit especially for organics right um then you want to try to minimize the the depth mm -hmm. that you're going to be doing that instead of you know plowing tilling six inches or eight inches you know try maybe three inches sure sure right well great conversation folks i i we do have a few questions here that i want to get to uh, as we kind of wrap up our time together sure. here um you know we've talked you mentioned the soil fungi a number of times and armin there's a question here from warren for you uh just can you talk a little bit about the elevated fungi product that you offer as well and you know kind of what's in that or kind of the source that it came from and and how how we're using that as a as a fungal component to the soil yeah uh, the the elevated fungi is uh, part of uh, ryan moss and uh, it's a fungal source that uh, uh, be more sacrophytic than it would be mycorrhizal Okay, so it would help break down more of the the nutrients for the soil and that kind of stuff on there. And so in this process, where we're getting that from is is also David Olson that we're able to pull that product and that has a, a shelf life. Not only that, it's it's more in a stasis form than if you extract it. Um, from the, you need to take it to the field right away because you haven't put it in a stasis, so it's not as vulnerable. But uh, that product uh, basically helping with that microbial population out there in the essence of, can we stimulate more bacteria that the fungal can keep on growing with and, and get that stimulated? So, you know, we got to remember, we're trying to get that seed out of the ground. And as Naja would say, you know, microbes are, are similar to the colostrum that a calf would get for the seed, you know. So what we're trying to initiate is that immediate growth. We got a lot of bacteria there. How can we get some of the fungal that wasn't there and get that started? That's why that product was brought to the marketplace. Yeah, and and for for a little bit deeper dive and explanation of that, go back and watch the webinar we did with David a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we do get into a few more details about what that is and how that works. Uh, one last question to kind of end on, and I think this is a great one to end on because the the end goal of all of this is to produce better and healthier food for people. Uh, that's that's you know why we want better soil, healthier soil, better biology, and so. Matt asked the question, has there been any 
nutrient density testing done on grain grown in a diverse regenerative type system versus conventional uh, production models? And, and do we also see any of that played out in livestock production? Are we producing better meat from a regenerative system than from a non-regenerative? I think everybody would say, yes, we, we are convinced that it is. Has there been some good testing done on that? Naja, are you aware uh, of that? And, and Armin, then maybe just briefly, you can talk a little bit about grain sense and, and how that could be something that you know could do some basic testing. Um, I think Dan Kitteridge has done some some studies on that. They've they've uh, developed an instrument that measures uh, nutrient density, and in order along with the measuring of the nutrient density in various uh, crops, um, they've uh, recorded what the cultivation practices are. So they can try to, to you know, line up what cultivation practices um, produce these high nutrient density um, crops. Uh, but the other, the other thing that that anybody who's grown cattle can attest to is if you have a forage that has um, higher forage quality and higher mineralization, more calcium, more potassium, more manganese, more magnesium, more zinc, more, all, you know, and, and i.e. more of everything else in it, um, the cattle will eat less of it and they do better. And that speaks of itself. We don't have to do a double blind controlled, uh, you know, study to know that when the cattle eat less and they do better, when you have a better quality forage, that's, I mean, that's, that speaks for itself, I think. Yeah, Keith, one, two of the things that we look at uh, is one in the soil, how we change in the soil, but then we also look at after that fruit or that crop has been produced and we're getting closer to harvest, we can uh, pull two weeks before you harvest seeds, thrash them, put them in this machine, it's called the grain sense machine and determine protein, carbohydrates, fats, and oils out of that and in different species, all the way from corn, soybeans, sunflower, um, different rice, those kind of things, and determine what the quality of that seed is. But the, the new measurement that we're looking at in the soil is a verified uh, that is Regen is using, and that's basically a test between six and uh, zero and six and six and 12 to determine you know, what your nitrogen and how do you qualify? So anything above seven on that uh, a health soil health score above a seven, it will promote qualifying you that you got a higher density in that fruit. Um, and Jim Rickstra, I was talking to him the other day and he actually had a, a field that uh, on his regen barley tested a 13, but he had another alfalfa field that tested a 34. He says, this year I need to go and plant corn in there if I want to get that corn into, into a bourbon or, you know, those yeah. kind of for a density. So, yes, there are methods out there of testing this ahead of time. So we kind of know that we can have a direction where we go and then apply the, you know, a diversity of microbes that have functionality to get a balance. And then after the balance is put out there and you've got your crop out there, how do you feed that? with all these different food sources that we mentioned in this in this call today out of the deal in order to promote that biology and that. So yes, Keith, there are ways in order to get that done. And I, yeah, I and I think with, with grains too, uh, a good indicator of high nutrient density is your, your um, bulk density, right? Mm -hmm. How heavy and dense is that grain? Because the micronutrients, I and mean, you go on a periodic table of elements and you look at, you know, how heavy is copper and how heavy is iron and how heavy is manganese, they're heavy. And if you get a little bit more of that stuff into the grain, it makes the grain heavier. Mm, so good point. Yeah. I, I posted the links to a couple of webinars we've done in the past. One with Steve Groff talking about that nutrient, the Dan Kittridge's nutrient density meter. And then also uh, a really good one with uh, Stefan Van Vliet. Uh, who is talking, he's with, uh, I think, uh, Utah State now, uh, talking about that same type of project, but specifically about uh, grass-fed uh, beef. So that, that's ongoing research. 
Uh, so this will give you a little bit of a taste of that. So great questions, great discussions, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have our last uh, in this series next week. Uh, we will be having uh, Sham Moti. Uh, Sham is uh, uh, an expert in mycorrhiza fungi. And we're going to be talking specifically about what mycorrhiza do in the soil, uh, the, the key role that they play, and then the, the formulation around our microgreen product that Sham had a hand in developing. It's a really unique, innovative product from, that we're importing uh, from, from India. Uh, so uh, that'll be our last one. And I think we'll end on a good note. So uh, Nasha, thank you so much for joining us. Armin, thank you for joining us. And thank you, everybody. Uh, for being part of this webinar series. We hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.